Here's a message from the future, from me and baby Emma. This book is extremely long, and it's got a lot of content. So this uh, reading of it is going to be cut into sections. I've tried my best to label them and keep them as coherent as possible and as separate as possible so that people who are interested in the book can pick and choose what they want. But, um, if you... Yeah. Mm. Did you see the Emma? Did you see? Look, it's Emma. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's it. I do recommend listening to this, you know, if, if you're interested in the book. Part of <laughs> on the scales, and you don't know for sure whether you want it or not. This is a great way to dip your toes in and start thinking about these kinds of things, which is oh, so much fun. So much fun to do. I mean, it's your life. And a life that's not well thought out is a life that's not fully lived. So, while I conjecture that I have lots of time to sit and think about my life and what I want, I'd like to pass that along to everyone who's much more busy than me at the moment. So the next section is on careers, and hopefully it'll be out in a little bit. And then we'll start talking about the exit. I think there'll be two separate parts. Uh, I hope you receive every blessing you could possibly ask for, and I hope that if you don't, you reach out and we see what we can do for each other. And we look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. We look forward to hearing from you. Bye bye. Oh, bye. Bye bye. Good job. Okay. Um. So, I'd like to start out saying that I have not posted a video in forever. I almost gave up on this idea, and I think it's still in the potential fail phase. But I wanted to at least push it a little further, see where we go, and, you know, you're not going to see results, so I wasn't focused on the results so much as I don't know where this is going. I don't know which direction, whether it's a monosyllabic conversation where I express my views, opinions, concerns, interests, and so on and so forth, and communicate with an audience, which of course is going to take time to see a level of um, positive feedback loop. There's just so much information and it is so hard to access it. And I know I want to do my part. What I'm vague on is I don't know what my part is and I don't know what it can be, but I'm sure through trial and error with this and from feedback from basically anybody who will give me feedback, I'm sure we can figure out where this road takes us. So first off, I want to give credit where credit is due. This amazing, beautiful picture is not mine. Um, I did pull it off Google Images, so for whoever's image this is, I hope one day this video finds you, and I'm very grateful for it. It's absolutely beautiful, stunning. So Book of the Day is Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. Photograph on the right, and it goes to Michael Lionstar for the image of the authors. And the reason we're doing this book has kind of our push back into whatever this is, um, it's really helpful in showing me that it's, it's not about the successes versus the failures. It is so easy to hear somebody say, just start, just try, give it a go, why not? It's so much harder to actually put it into action and to hear words that not only resonate with generally the public, but also these words have resonated for a long time. So just a little bit of background, um, as far as I'm aware, and as far as the book says, it does say that they both teach a class either together, or somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in these lectures, they were psychologists, and they had a lot of questions come up, and they realized that a lot of the information that they were giving out to them, it didn't come as easily, but once you get it, it's so much easier to pass it on. So that's what makes this book so important to me is because that's what I enjoy. 
I enjoy passing it on. I enjoy informing others of things that they might not have known prior to our engagement. So I'm going to start off right in the beginning where it says, um, designers love questions. Questions are simple in just about anything. So your question can be as silly as why does the moon shine from the reflection of the sun? These questions all lead to how your mind works. It, and your answers are always right. There's no real wrong answer as long as you're actually asking the question. That's the kind of start of how to get the ball rolling is you have to genuinely be curious about the question. So there are five mindsets that you're going to learn throughout this book. They are curiosity, bias to action, reframing, awareness, and radical collaboration. Start being curious. Curiosity makes everything new. It invites exploration. It makes everything play. And most of all, curiosity is going to help you quote, get good at being lucky. End quote. It's the reason some people see opportunities everywhere. The second reframing is try stuff. When you have a bias to action, you are committed to building your way forward. There's no sitting on a bench just thinking about what you are going to do. There is only getting in the game. Designers try things. They test things out. They create prototype after prototype, failing often until they find what works and what solves the problem. Sometimes they find the problem is entirely different from what they thought it was originally. Designers embrace change. They are not attached to a particular outcome because they are always focused on what will happen next, not what the final result will be. Number three, reframing problems. Reframing is how designers get unstuck. Reframing is also to make sure we are working on the right problems. Life design involves key reframes that allow you to step back, examine if you have biases and what they are, and open up to new solution spaces. Throughout the book, we will be reframing dysfunctional beliefs that prevent people from finding the careers and the lives that they want. Reframing is essential to finding the right problems and the right solutions. That's one of my favorite key points just to interject here for personally. I've found a lot of what I think is intrinsically biased. And it's hard because I didn't realize how much my opinion wasn't really my opinion. You know, everybody has an opinion on some everything, everything. Your opinion comes from somewhere, whether it's something your mother taught you when you were a child, father, aunt, uncle, you got burned once so you never again touched a hot stove. Your opinions are important. They form you. But being able to step out of yourself for a moment and say, well, what else is there? What else can I do? What else? What other way can I look at this? Aside from the way that I am, aside from the way that I know is right. And that helps push me so much further than I ever even thought was possible. Number four, no, it's a process. We know that life gets messy. For every step forward, it can seem like you're making two steps back. Mistakes will be made, prototypes thrown away. An important part of the process is letting go of your first idea and of a good, but not great, solution. Sometimes amazing designs can emerge from the mess. The slinky was invented this way. Teflon was created this way, super glue, Play-Doh, none of these things would exist if a designer somewhere, somehow, hadn't screwed up. When you learn to think like a designer, you learn to be aware of the process. Life is a journey. Let go of the end goal and focus on the process and see what happens next. And number five, asking for help. The last mindset of designed thinking is perhaps the most important especially when it comes to designing your life. Radical collaboration. What this means is simple. You are not alone. The best designers know that great design requires radical collaboration. It takes a team. A painter can create an artistic masterpiece alone on a windswept coast, but a designer cannot create the iPhone alone, windswept beach or not. And your life is more like great design than a work of art. 
so you cannot create it alone either. You do not have to come up with a brilliant life design by yourself. Design is a collaborative process, and many of the best ideas are going to come from other people. You just need to talk. You need to ask and to know the right questions to ask. In this book, you will learn how to use mentors and a supportive community to help with your life design. When you reach out to the world, the world reaches right back, and this changes everything. In other words, life design, like all design, is a team sport. So we're not very passionate about finding your passion. We believe that people actually need to take time to develop a passion. And the research shows that for most people, passion comes after they try something, discover they like it, and develop mastery, not before. To put it more succinctly, passion is the result of good life design, not the cause. Most people do not have that one thing that they are passionate about. A singular motivator can drive all their life decisions and infuses every waking moment with a sense of purpose and meaning. If the present day is your purpose in living, we salute you. Charles Darwin spent 39 years studying earthworms. And we salute Charles Darwin. What we don't salute is a method of approaching life design that leaves out 80% of the population. In truth, most people are passionate about many different things, and the only way to know what to do is to prototype some potential lives, try them out, and see what really resonates with them. We are serious about this. You don't need to know your passion in order to design a life you love. Once you know to prototype your way forward, you are on a path to discovering things that you truly love, passion or not. In life design, if it is not actionable, it is a gravity problem, and it is therefore not a problem. Let's repeat that. If it is not actionable, it is not a problem. It's a solution, a circumstance, a fact of life. It may be a drag, so to speak. But like gravity, it is not a problem that can be solved. Here is a little tidbit of what's going to save you a lot of time, months, years, decades even. It has to do with reality. People fight reality. They fight it tooth and nail with everything they've got. And any time when you're arguing or fighting with reality, reality wins. You can't outsmart it. You can't trick it. And you can't bend it to your will. Not now. Not ever. Even though you can work on this problem in a way that isn't possible with gravity, we'd recommend that you accept it and it is an inactionable solution. If you do that, then your attention is freed to start designing other solutions to other problems. The statistics are unmistakably on this one. If you've been unemployed for a long time, you have a harder task to get reemployed. Research using identical resumes with no difference but the duration of unemployment made clear that most employers avoid the long-term unemployed, apparently groundlessly concluding that whatever else didn't, whoever else didn't hire you during that time must have had a good reason. That's a gravity problem. You can't change employers' perspectives. Instead of changing how they think, how about working on changing how you appear to them? You can take volunteer roles and list significant professional results without having to get into how little you were paid until much later in the conversation. You can identify roles in industries in which are less ageism. Embrace the good things come from just accepting it. Reframe the company's family legacy as your source of job security with a decent income and dependable firm knowing you won't have to take on increased responsibilities and adjusting to endless promotions you'll be able to learn this job so you can do it in 35 hours resulting in a good work-life balance bracing the good things that come from just accepting gravity problems realize what good you can actually extract from it the key, the key is to not get stuck on something that you have effectively no chance of succeeding at and we are all for aggressive and world-changing goals Please do fight City Hall, oppose injustice, work for women's rights, pursue food justice and homelessness, combat global warming, but do it smart. If you become open-minded enough to accept reality, 
you'll be freed to reframe an actual problem and design a way to participate in the world on things that matter to you and might even work. That's all we're after here. We want to give you the best possible shot at living the life you want, enjoying the living of it, maybe even making a difference while you're at it. We are going to help you create the best designed life available to you in reality, not in some fictional world with less gravity or rich poets. The only response to a gravity problem is acceptance. And this is where good designers begin. This is the you are here or accept phase of design thinking, acceptance. That's why you start where you are, not where you think you should be, but right where you are. That's why I start these videos with my grainy focus in, focus out camera and actually absolutely no idea which direction this is going to take me. You find your beginning. Find what makes you happy. Those of you who are watching the video, not listening to the audio, will notice I have the dashboard up here. A way to take stock of your current situation, the you are here, for you, is to focus on what they call the health, work, play, love dashboard. Think of it like gauges on your car's dashboard. I know it's awful hard to see, so I'll point out, this says dashboard, this says work, play, love, health, down there, there's zero, over here it's full. Now the reason I put a picture of it is there is a workbook that comes along with this book. Um, you know, not, this isn't a promotion, this isn't advocating for this book. Um, although, I would highly recommend you go buy the workbook. It will teach you so much about yourself just tell you something about your car. Do you have enough gas to complete your journey? Is there oil in the engine to help it run smoothly? Is it hot? Is something about to blow? Similarly, the HWPL dashboard will tell you something about the four things that provide energy and focus for your journey to keep your life running smoothly. Now here's the first dysfunctional belief that they have. It says, I should already know where I'm going. These are the things that are you have to unlearn Unlearning things is so much harder than starting from scratch and learning it because you have to physically tell yourself every time why your personal belief is not true. The reframe is you can't know where you're going until you know where you are. Extremely important. A lot of people are in denial. I'm in denial. I'm in denial about a lot of things. Everybody has something that they are in denial about. And it's okay. It's important. It's part of you. It's who you are. When you realize it and you can honestly, genuinely look at yourself and say, this is how much work I've been doing. This is how much playing I've been doing lately. My love gauge is a little low. and My health gauge is a little low. You can see what's eating at your soul, that little piece of you that hurts. You can physically see it with this dashboard. Even though perfect balance is not our goal, a look at this diagram can sometimes warn us that something is not right. Like an emergency light on your car's dashboard, the diagram may serve as an indicator that it's time to pull over and figure out what's wrong. As you begin to think like a designer, remember one important thing. It is impossible to predict the future. And the corollary to that thought is, once you design something, it changes the future that is possible. Wrap your mind around that. Designing something changes the future that is possible. So, although it is not possible to know your future or figure out a great life design before you begin, at least you have a good idea of your starting point. Now it's time to get you pointed in the right direction for a journey ahead. For that, you will need a compass. For your compass, our goal for your life is rather simple. Coherency. A coherent life is one lived in such a way that you can clearly connect the dots between three things. Who you are, what you believe, and what you are doing. There is a section where you do your dashboard. The next few pages in the workbook and throughout this book 
are about your life view and your work view. Now these things are so personal that I won't get into them here with you. I highly suggest you take a look. If, even if you look online, at least you can get an idea of what these mean. As far as life view, I'm going to minimally get into it with the questions who you are, what you believe, and what you are doing. As for the work view reflection, a few questions you can ponder for yourself. Why work? What's work for? What does work mean? How does it relate to the individual, others, society? What defines good or worthwhile work? What does money have to do with it? What do experience, growth, and fulfillment have to do with it? And for the life view reflection, why are we here? What is the meaning or purpose of life? What is the relationship between the individual and others? Where do family, country, and the rest of the world fit in? What is good and what is evil? Is there a higher power, God, or something transcendent? And if so, what impact does it have on your life? What is the role of joy, sorrow, justice, injustice, love, and peace, and strife in your personal life? The next page has a coherency work view and life view integration work set. Where do your views on life and work complement one another? Where do they clash? And does one drive the other? And if so, how? The next dysfunctional belief they have listed is I should know where I'm going. The reframe is I won't always know where I'm going, but I can always know whether I'm going in the right direction. There's your compass. Now, here, we get into the Good Time Journal activity log. So, the thought behind this is to log all of the times where you notice you are in a quote-unquote flow state. Specifically, when you are in the zone. When you zone out and you're so happy and excited and focused and you have maximum energy post this this whatever it is, write it down, and these are for you specifically. After adjusting his schedule to surround the less engaging activities with more engaging activities, Bill, the writer, gives himself a small reward when he completes energy-negative tasks. The best way to deal with these energy-negative activities is to make sure that you are well-rested and have the energy reserves needed to do them right. Otherwise, you might find yourself doing them again, costing you more energy and time than it really should. It might surprise you what gives you most engagement, and honestly, write things that you don't enjoy in there. Write things that you absolutely loathe. Keep an idea for a week about what it is you do and don't do, and it will put a lot of things that have been sliding under the rug that you have gone unnoticed to the forefront so you can visually see what makes you happy and what makes you sad throughout your day and it can be not just work specific parts of work like meeting with a client high energy sitting in front of the computer low energy and there's all sorts of answers and there's no wrong answer so fun so things to write in your journal Let's try with activities. What were you actually doing? Was this a structured or unstructured activity? Did you have a specific role to play, like team leader, or were you just a participant at a meeting? Two, environments. Our environment has a profound effect on our emotional state. You feel one way about a fo at a football stadium and another in a cathedral. Notice where you were when you were involved in the activity. What kind of place was it? And how did it make you feel? Number three, interactions. What are you interacting with? People or machines? Was it a new kind of interaction or one you are familiar with? Was it formal or informal? Number four, objects. Were you reacting with any objects, devices, iPads, smartphones, hockey sticks, sailboats? Were there objects that created or supported you feeling engaged? Were they objects that you created and felt attached to? Number five, users. Who else was there? 
what role did they play in making either a positive or a negative energy experience? Those are the A-E-I-O-U's, activities, environments, interactions, objects, and users. Using A-E-I-O-U can really help you zoom in efficiently and discover specifically what it is or isn't working for you. The next dysfunctional belief that they have is I'm stuck. That's what I've been feeling personally for a little while now. Very stuck, set, cooked and done. The reframe of that is I'm never stuck because I can always generate a lot of ideas. Even if you're just sick and tired of something, sit through your head and start asking yourself those questions we talked about. Anything, even, not even if it's a silly question. There are no silly questions. These are your questions to you with your answers. And as long as you're serious about the question, then you'll get the answer that you truly want. The second dysfunctional belief is I have to find one right idea. The reframe is I need a lot of ideas so that I can explore any number of possibilities for my future. You're never going to find what makes you happy if you don't at least try something else. Just looking at it isn't going to give you a clear example of what it is. I was recently watching a video about traveler's remorse. A lot of people are interested in Japanese culture, right? So you get to Japan and it's absolutely beautiful and amazing and you love it and your expectations are up here and everything is up here and you're great. Then you get used to everything and, you know, all this amazing becomes humdrum. And then as it becomes humdrum, you begin to miss home and as you begin to fall deeper and deeper into that, depending on how low your low is, you'll, co you'll fall into traveler's remorse. So long as you stick through and persevere, you will go up in your high again, but you'll never know whether or not you do truly want to travel and visit this amazing exotic, exotic place. You never can tell. And you can't tell from somebody else's experience either because this person has a completely biased opinion based on X, Y, or Z. This one right idea way of thinking is not designed thinking. It's just grasping at whatever might be in reach, and it is unlikely to result in long-term satisfaction. Designers get stuck all the time. Being stuck can be a launching pad for creativity. When you think like a designer, you know how to ideate, how to flare, to come up with lots of options for lots of possibilities. Look, it's simple. You can't know what you want until you know what you might want. So you are going to have to generate a lot of ideas and possibilities. Accept the problem, get stuck, get over it, ideate, ideate, ideate. Question, question, question. Come up with the next idea, and the next idea, and the next idea. We're all stuck in some way. So many people get stuck chasing their first idea or their perfect idea or that one big idea that will solve the problem, will be the answer, and will dig them out of whatever hole they're currently stuck in. That's a lot of pressure. Believing that there's only one idea out there leads to a lot of pressure and indecision. I'm just not sure. I don't want to blow it. I really need to get this right. If I just had a better, the right, a killer idea, then all would be well. Let's stop right here so we can be the first to tell you an amazing fact. All will be well. It will. There's always going to be a better idea, a better way, even a best way. That kind of thinking is pretty dangerous to your own life. The truth is that all of us have more than one life in us. When we asked our students how many lifetimes worth living are there in you, the average answer is three to four. And if you accept this idea that there are multiple great designs for your life, though you'll still only get to live one, it is rather liberating. There is no one idea for your life. There are many lives you could live happily and productively, no matter how many years old you are. And there are lots of different paths you could take to live each of these productive, amazing, different lives. Quantity has a quality all of its own. In life design, more is better because more ideas equal access to 
better ideas, and better ideas lead to a better design. Designers love to ideate broadly and widely. We all have to defer judgment and silence the inner critic if we want to get all our ideas out. If we don't, we may have a few good ideas, but the majority will have been lost, silently imprisoned behind a wall of judgment our prefrontal cortex has erected to safeguard us from making our mistakes and looking foolish. Now, we love the prefrontal cortex and wouldn't be caught in public without it, but we don't want to taking our ideas hostage prematurely. If we can get into the wild idea space and we know what we've overcome premature judgment, the crazy idea may not be the one that stick and rarely are actually, but often after having a crazy idea, we have moved up to new creative space and we can see new innovation and new possibilities that we can work with. So let's bring on the crazy. As a life designer, you need to embrace two philosophies. Number one, you choose better when you have a lot of good ideas to choose from. And number two, you never choose your first solution to any problem. Our minds are generally lazy and like to get rid of problems as quickly as possible. So they surround the first idea with lots of positive chemicals that make us fall in love with them. Do not fall in love with your first idea. The relationship almost never works out. Most often, our first solutions are pretty average and not creative. Humans have a tendency to suggest the obvious first. Learning to use great ideation tools helps overcome this bias towards obvious and helps you to regain a sense of creative confidence. So what we're going to talk about next is this craziness. For those of you who are just listening with audio, it's a web design. So how this works is you start with one idea, anything, a word, anything that just kind of piques your interest. And you branch off from that idea and you draw webs and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going until you feel like you're satisfied. The trick is don't do this the first time. Personally, I did it on a separate sheet of paper before I started in my workbook simply because I knew I couldn't do it the first few times as efficiently as this. And you know, this isn't efficient at all. These are just options and ideas. Um, throughout the web, like inspiration, observation, empathy, beyond the individual. These are all things that could come from your ideas. They give you an idea of what you should be thinking of. And the reason that this is so amazing is it blocks that, not lizard brain, the prefrontal cortex is the thing that protects us from making bad decisions. It blocks that so we can just automatically get it out there. You know when you blurt out something and it's a Freudian slip? It's a Freudian slip that you are intentionally invoking. And these Freudian slips, like we were talking about earlier with the crazy ideas, tend to be the most beautiful ideas for your future. I'll leave this up for anybody to look at, though I don't know how you could possibly. <laughs> so mind mapping process has three steps. Picking a topic, making the mind map, and making secondary connections and creating concepts or mashing it all up. So this helps unanchor us from things that we don't notice that we are attached to because we tend to bring along all the bad with us to the future. We can't just let it go. It helps to be able to see it to let it go properly. So the best ways to unanchor yourself from immovable solutions is to reframe the solution and prototype a little. Don't make a doable problem into an anchor problem by wedding yourself irretrievably to a solution that isn't working. Reframe the solution to some other possibilities, prototype those ideas, take some test hikes, and get yourself unstuck. Anchor problems keep us stuck because we can only see one solution, the one we already have that doesn't work. Anchor problems are not only about the current failed approach, they're really about the fear that no matter what else we try, that won't work either, and then we'll have to admit that we're permanently stuck, meaning we're screwed, and that we'd rather be stuck than screwed. Sometimes it is more comfortable to hold on to our familiar failed approach to the problem than to risk a worse failure by attempting the big changes that we think will be required to eliminate it. This is pretty common, but paradoxical human behavior. 
Change is always uncertain. There is no guarantee of success, no matter how hard you try. It makes sense to be fearful. The way forward is to reduce the risk and the fear of failure by designing a series of small prototypes to test the waters. It's okay to prototype to fail. It's supposed to. But well-designed prototypes teach you something with that failure about the future. Prototypes lower your anxiety, ask interesting questions, and get you data on the potential of change that you are trying to accomplish. One of the principles of design thinking is that you want to fail fast and fail forward into your next step. When you're stuck with an anchor problem, try reframing the challenge as an exploration of possibilities. Instead of trying to solve your huge problem in one miraculous leap, then decide to try a series of small, safe prototypes of the change you'd like to see happen. It should result in getting unstuck and finding a more creative approach to your problem. We'll talk more about this later, but this is a good way to dip your toes into it. An anchor problem is a real problem, just a hard one. It's actionable, but we've been stuck on it for so long, or so often, it seems insurmountable, which is why such a problem has to be reframed and then opened up with new ideas and knocked down to size by prototyping. Gravity problems aren't actually problems. They're circumstances that you can do nothing to change. There is no solution to a gravity problem, only acceptance and redirection. You can't defy the laws of nature, nor do we live in a world where poets reliably make a million dollars a year. Life designers know that if a problem isn't actionable, then it's not solvable. Designers may be artful at reframing and inventing, but they know better than to go up against the laws of nature or the marketplace. We are here to get you unstuck. We want you to have lots of ideas and lots of options. When you have lots of ideas, you can build prototypes of your life and then test them out. That's what life designers do. So the next step is mind mapping with your good time journal. If you didn't do your good time journal in the last chapter, please go back and do it now because you're going to need it for this next step. So what we're going to do is look on the outer ring of one of your maps and pick three disparate items that catch your eye. You'll know which ones they are intuitively. They're the ones that jump out at you. They're either the crazy ones or the ones you really like or the ones that, you know, you have no idea how you got to and it's interesting. Now try to combine those three items into a possible job description that would be fun and interesting to you and would help someone else. Again, it may not be practical or appeal to lots of people or employers. Name your role and draw a napkin sketch of it. A quick what it is. For example, we've got Grant, who was languishing away at a car rental agency. He did this exercise based on when he was engaged in life, hiking in redwoods, playing pickup basketball, helping his niece and nephew, and he ended up drawing a sketch of himself leading a pirate surf camp for children, <laughs> which is you know, totally outrageous. Number four, do this exercise three times, once for each of your mind maps, minimum, making sure that the three versions are completely different from one another. Now what? The point of this exercise isn't to generate a specific result. It's to get your mind going all over the place and ideating without judgment. By taking the exercise all the way to imagining how to combine elements creatively into surprising roles or jobs, you've successfully moved out of problem solving what do I do next, into design thinking, what can I imagine? The next chapter, design your life. The plain and simple truth is that you will live many different lives in this lifetime. If the life you are currently living feels a bit off, don't worry. Life design gives you endless mulligans. You can do it over at any point and any time. Correction shots are always allowed. Working with adults of all ages, they've found that where people go wrong, regardless of age, education, or career path, is thinking that they need to come up with a plan for their lives, and then it will be smooth sailing. If only they make the right choice, the best, true, and only choice, they will have a blueprint for who they will be, what they will do, and how they will live. Eight by numbers approach to life. 
But in reality, life is more of an abstract painting, one that's open to multiple interpretations. Then it tells the story of somebody who, you know, they were applying to a bunch of different colleges because they wanted to know which college would accept them, and based on that decision, that would be their career path. But then, something awful happened. He was accepted into four of the six internship programs, including his top three choices. Getting in wasn't awful. It's what happened next. Total indecision. He had no idea what to do. He had no idea how to solve the age-old problem of not knowing what to do. If he didn't get it right, he risked ending up with a second-choice life. But he didn't know what his first choice was. It was a very common mistake. He thought there was only one best way to spend his life and had to know what it was, or he'd be settling for second best or worse. But that's not true. We all contain enough energy and talents and interests to live many different types of lives, all of which would be authentic and interesting and productive. Asking which life is best is like asking a silly question. It's like asking whether it's better to have hands or feet. Finally, it dawned on him. The reason that he couldn't figure out which one was best is that there was no best. There were three great and totally different possibilities in front of him, and at this point in his life, he could afford to check them all out. And that's what he did. This person had the tools that they could use and accepted that there was more than one happy path they could chart their life by. Their buddy, his buddies didn't have confidence. So he started spending time helping each of them figure out what they could do next. And he actually found out he loved doing that. In fact, he loved it so much that he decided to investigate how he could do the same kind of helping all the time. Right after the first internship, he canceled the next two and went to grad school in career counseling. After finally accepting that there were at least three great careers he could live into well, he discovered a fourth. That's the sort of thing that happens when you stop trying to get it right and start designing your way forward. The next dysfunctional belief is, I need to figure out my best possible life, make a plan, and then execute it. The reframe is there are multiple great lives and plans within me, and I get to choose which one to build my way forward to the next. Just rereading that gives instills so much confidence in me that at least doing this is something. At least I'm not just sitting, you know? And it's so much easier said than done. It is so hard, it was so hard for me to actually get this far to this point where I felt comfortable doing this. This isn't comfortable, this isn't something I thought I would be doing, but it's something and it's pointing me somewhere. And it, it's just, you know, I'll let you guys know how it works out at the end thing we're going to talk about is Odyssey Planning 101. Create three alternative versions of the next five years of your life. Each one must include a visual graphical timeline. That's this. Include personal and non-career events as well. Do you want to be married, trained to win CrossFit games, learn how to bend spoons with your mind? A title for each option in the form of a six-word headline describing the essence of this alternative. That's this. Then we need questions that this alternative is asking, preferably two or three. A good designer asks questions to test assumptions and reveal new insights. In each potential timeline, you will investigate different possibilities and learn different things about yourself and the world. What kinds of things will you want to test and explore in each alternate version? So here's one. A dashboard where you can gauge. Oh my gosh, I can't reach all the way down there. Whoops, all the way down there. All the way. Should I put that in the bloopers? I don't know. We're going to see. We're going to see. Hopefully. A gash... A gashboard. Uh, a dashboard. <clears throat> a dashboard where you can gauge all the way over there. Resources. Do you have the objective resources? Time, money, skills, contacts you need to pull off your plan? Likeability, which is the second gauge. Are you hot, cold, or warm about your plan? And the third one, which I can almost reach is confidence. Are you feeling full of confidence or pretty uncertain about pulling this off? And then last but not least, coherence. Does this plan make sense within itself? Is it consistent with you, your work view, and your life view? 
Possible considerations are geography, where will you live? What will the experience or learning will you gain? What are your impacts, results of choosing this alternative? What will the life look like? A particular role, industry, or company do you see yourself in? Other ideas. Hmm, I look like some of these. Do keep in mind things other than career and money. Even though these things are important, if not central, to the decisive direction of your next few years, there are other critical elements that you want to pay attention to. Number two, any of the other considerations listed above can be a springboard for forming your alternative lives for the next five years. If you find yourself stuck, try making a mind map out of any of the design considerations listed above. Don't overthink this exercise, and don't skip it. For all of us, the Odyssey plan can define important things still to do with our lives, to help us remember dreams we may have forgotten. The 12-year-old astronaut that you were once were is still in there. Be curious about what else you might discover. Try making at least one of these plans at least a little bit wild. Even if it's something you would never do in your right mind, write down your most far-fetched and crazy idea. Maybe it's giving up all your worldly possessions and living off the grid in Alaska or India. Maybe it's taking an acting class and trying to make it in Hollywood. Perhaps it's becoming an expert skater or devoting your life to an adrenaline-producing extreme sports. Or maybe it's hunting down that long-lost great-uncle filling in the gaps of your family story. You may want to do alternative plans for different areas of your life. Alternatives for career, for love, for health, or for play. You may want to combine these elements. The only wrong way to do it is to not do it at all. Here I have kind of the baseboard background of what you would be looking at for the pages in the workbook. This is the blank version. It is so crystal clear and clean compared to the other ones. It's your job to fill it in and fill it in with vigor. This is your life. This is the rest of your life. This should be one of the most important things that you enjoy doing ever. And if it's not, put it down. Come back to it later. Who cares? It's for you. Try stuff. The Odyssey plan. Create three alternative five-year plans, including the worksheet involved, which is in the workbook, so I highly suggest getting the workbook again. Give each alternative a descriptive six-word title and write down three questions that arise from each version. This question. Complete each gauge on the dashboard, ranking the alternative resources, likability, confidence, and coherence, and then present your plan to another person, a group, or your life design team. Note how each alternative energizes you. This part we didn't really talk about a lot, but communicating this to others is really important because when you start doing these things, you don't want to feel ashamed that you're doing it. You want to be sure. You want to have all the questions that everybody's going to ask you already prepared, already done, already you know. The best way to do that is to find somebody you trust, you care about their opinion, and maybe somebody who's already been through it and actually show them. Have a nice laugh. Who cares? Life's short. The next dysfunctional belief comes from the chapter of prototyping. If I comprehensively research the best data for all aspects of my plan, I'll be fine. The reframe is I should build prototypes to explore questions about my alternatives. The reason that that's so important and highly valued is you don't know <laughs> what opinions are what is a, what data is opinions? There's no true way to know until you actually experience it for yourself. Use the term prototyping and design thinking. We do not mean making something to check whether your solution is right. We don't mean creating a representation of a completed design, nor do we mean making just one thing. Designers make lots of prototypes, never just a prototype. Prototyping, the life design way, is all about asking good questions, outing the hidden biases and assumptions, iterating rapidly, and creating momentum for a path we'd like to try out. Prototypes should be designed to ask a question and get some data about something you're interested in. Good prototypes isolate one aspect of a problem and design an experience that allows you to quote-unquote try out some version of a potentially interesting future. Prototypes help you visualize alternatives in a very experiential way. That allows you to imagine your future as if you were already living it. Creating new experiences through prototyping will give you an opportunity to understand what a new career path might feel like, even if it's only for an hour a day, or a day. 
And prototyping helps you involve others early and helps build a community of folks who are interested in your journey and your life design. Prototypes are a great way to start a conversation, and more often than not, one thing typically leads to another. Prototypes frequently turn into unexpected opportunities. They help serendipity happen. Finally, prototypes allow you to try and fail rapidly without over-investing in a path before you have any data. Our philosophy is that it is always possible to prototype something you are interested in. The best way to get started is to keep your first few prototypes very low resolution and very simple. You want to isolate one variable and design a prototype that answers one question. Use what you have available or can ask for and be prepared to iterate quickly. And remember that a prototype is not a thought experiment. It must involve a physical experience in the world. The data to make good decisions are found in the real world, and prototyping is the best way to engage the world and get data that you need to move forward. Prototyping is also about building empathy and understanding. A prototyping process inevitably requires collaboration, working with others. Everyone is on a journey, and your prototype encounters with others will reveal their life designs and give you ideas for your own life. So, we prototype to ask good questions, create experiences, and reveal our assumptions, fail fast, fail forward, sneak up on the future, and build empathy for ourselves and others. Once you accept that this is the only way to get the data you need, prototyping becomes an integral part of your life design process. Not only is it true that doing prototyping is a good idea, it's equally true that not prototyping is a bad and sometimes very costly idea. And the next part is prototyping conversations, a life design interview. A life design interview is incredibly simple. It just means getting someone's story. Not just anyone and not just any story, of course. You want to talk to someone who is either doing and living what you are contemplating or has real experience and expertise in an area of which you have questions. And the story you're after is a personal story of how that person got doing the thing that he or she does, or got to be an expertise he or has, or what it's really like to do what she does. You want to hear what the person who does what you might someday want to do loves and hates about their job. You want to know what their day looks like, and then you want to see if you can imagine yourself doing that job and loving it for months and years on end, in addition to asking people about their work and life. You may also be able to find out how they got there, their career path. Most people fail not for lack of talent, but for lack of imagination. You can get a lot of this information by sitting down with someone and getting his or her story. That's life design interviewing. The first thing to know about life design interview is what it's not. It's not a job interview. If you find yourself in the middle of a life design interview and you're answering questions or talking about yourself rather than getting the story of the person you're with, stop and flip it around. This is critical. If the person you're in conversation with misperceives that your meeting is a job interview, then it's a disaster and your life design interview has failed or will fail. It's all about mindsets. Think about it. When someone thinks you're looking for a job, the first thing on his or her mind actually has nothing to do with you at all. They're thinking, do we have a job opening to discuss? The answer to that is actually usually no. So most of the time you are trying to get a meeting and the other person thinks you're looking for a job and you don't get the appointment, you just get no. It may seem like a harsh and presumptuous rejection, but it's actually the kindest and most supportive thing that this person can do. If in fact you are looking for a job and that person hasn't got one to give or isn't influential in the hiring process, the best thing they can do for you is to tell you you are free to go find someone with an opening who can actually be helpful to you. It doesn't feel like an act of kindness, and most people deliver rejection poorly, but that's what's actually happening. If it turns out the answer to the first question is, yes, we do have an opening available, then the second question is, does she fit here? The mindset of a job interview is critique and judgment, and that is not the mindset we are looking for for an interesting story and a personal connection. In fact, a life design interview isn't an interview at all. It's really just a conversation. So when trying to get a meeting with someone, you don't use the term interview because that person will assume you mean a job interview, unless you're a journalist and that will make them even more nervous for other reasons. 
All you are doing is trying to identify people who are currently doing things that you are interested in and whose stories you want to get. And it's way easier than you think. As soon as you've determined that Anna is a cool person doing really interesting work, you and Anna have something in common. You both think that she and what she's doing are two of your favorite topics. <laughs> the essence of the request of a meeting to have this conversation is, Hello, Anna. I'm so glad to connect with you. John said you were just the person I needed to speak with. I'm very impressed with what I know of your work. I'd love to hear some of your story. Might you have 30 minutes to spare at a time and place convenient to you where I can buy you a cup of coffee and hear more about your experience? That's about it. Really. And yes, it is important to mention Anna's respected friend or colleague, John, if at all possible. John is the guy whose referral made all the difference in your finding Anna and in her being more inclined to accept your request for coffee. There are lots of Annas in the world who will have coffee with you, or even if there wasn't a referral by John, but it works a lot better if you can get a referral. We'll talk about how to get referrals later. It's called networking. Yes, you have to network to do life design efficiently, but more on that later. Prototyping conversations are great. They're incredibly informative and easy to come by. But you're going to want more than just stories as input for coming up with your life design. You want actual experience of what it is really like by watching others do it, better yet, doing some form of it yourself. Prototyping experiences allows us to learn through a direct encounter with a possible future version of us. This experiential version could involve spending a day shadowing a professional you'd like to be, take a friend to work day, <laughs> or a one-week unpaid exploratory project that you create, or a three-month internship. Obviously, a three-month internship requires more investment and a longer commitment. If you've conducted a good number of prototype conversations using life design interviewing, then you will have met people along the way who are interested in observing or shadowing. So that variety of prototyping should be pretty accessible for you. You just have to ask. And remember, people enjoy being helpful. Most people we work with are surprised with how well their life design interviews go. The people they meet really seem to enjoy it. Asking to shadow somebody at work is a much bigger favor than a 30-minute cup of coffee. But after a dozen or so prototype conversations, you'll be ready to make a bigger request. Try it, even if you have to try a few times. You'll learn a great deal. Coming up with the hands-on prototype experience in which you actually get to do stuff, not just hear about stuff or watch stuff, is an even bigger challenge. But it's well worth the effort to get your hands dirty and really discover something that fits you. Conceiving prototype experiences like this is real design work, and it's going to require having lots of ideas. So this is a great time to introduce design brainstorming, a collaborative technique for finding lots of ideas. Here we go. Look back at your odyssey plan you made in the previous chapter. We hope these spark some future versions of you that you'd like to explore. They suggest life design brainstorming, and it has four steps, a very structural approach to coming up with lots of prototyping ideas. Typically, if you are a facilitator who brings the group together, you might have already framed the brainstorming topic. You want a team of no fewer than three, and rarely more than six people, who have all volunteered to help. Once the group is conceived, the sessions proceed as follows. Number one, framing a good question. It is important to frame a good question for a brainstorming session. The facilitator uses the process of coming up with the question as a way to create a focus for the group's energy. When coming up with the question, the facilitator needs to be aware of some guidelines. If the question isn't open-ended, you won't get very interesting results and not much volume. You also want to be careful not to include your solution accidentally in your question. This happens all the time. They want to brainstorm 10 new ways to make a ladder for a stockroom. This isn't a very good framed question because a ladder is a solution and they only want 10 ideas. A better way would be to focus on what a ladder does. How many ways can you think to give a person access to inventory in high places? Or, how many ways can you think of to give a stock person three-dimensional mobility in a warehouse? Also, be careful that you don't frame a question so broadly that it's meaningless. We sometimes sit in life design brainstorms where the question is, how many ways can we think of to make Bob happy? This vague question fails on a couple of reasons. First of all, 
Happiness means too many different things to too many different people. And positive psychology tells us that happiness is context dependent. So without context, such as my work, my social life, no one knows where to start. And without some constraints, these type of brainstorming sessions tend to generate ideas that are neither prototypable prototypable, prototypable, or satisfying. Most of the time when people tell us our brainstorm didn't work, we find out they had a poorly framed question, either, either one that already had a solution or that one that was so vague they couldn't get attraction for generating ideas. Watch out for this when you brainstorm with this four-step method. Step two, warming up. People need to transition from their hectic, event-driven workday to a state of relaxed, creative attention if they are going to do a good job brainstorming. People need some support in transactional activity to move from their analytical, critical brain to the synthesizing, non-judgmental brain. It is a mind-body problem, and it takes some practice to get good at making such a transition. A good facilitator tends to lead the way and make sure everyone is warmed up and feeling creative. This is essential for if brainstorming is going to be high energy and generate a lot of ideas. You can visit their website, www.designyour.life, for a list of exercises and improvisational games that they use all the time with their students. Step 3. The brainstorm itself. As they mentioned from the start, brainstorming need to be facilitated. A facilitator sets up the room and makes sure there are pens and sticky notes of paper for every participant and that the space is quiet and comfortable. The facilitator frames the question, manages the warm-ups, warm and makes sure that everything is said is recorded, and manages the rules. We recommend all participants have their own pens and notepads to write down their ideas. That way, the group isn't constrained by how fast the facilitators can record ideas, and there's less chance of losing a potentially good idea. Some good guidelines that they leave is go for quantity, not quality, defer judgment, and do not censor ideas build off of ideas of others, and encourage wild ideas. Number four, naming and framing the outcomes. This is perhaps the most important part of the brainstorm, the one activity most groups leave out. They might take a cell phone picture of their wall full of sticky notes, high-five all around, and then leave. The problem with this is the information on the wall is pretty fragile, and if it isn't processed right away, the freshness of the ideas and their interconnections get lost. Later, participants often feel that nothing happened, and they can't remember what it was accomplished. Ideas should be counted. You want to be able to say, we had 141 ideas, group similar ideas together by subject or category, name those categories, and frame the results with reference to the original vocal question. Every unique category is given a descriptive and often funny name that captures the essence of that group of ideas then vote. Voting is important. It should be done silently so people aren't influencing one another. We like to use color dots to cast votes, but we also like to use categories such as most exciting, one we wish we could do if money were no subject, the dark horse. It probably won't work, but if it did. Number four, <laughs> number four, the most likely to lead a great life. And number five, if we could ignore the laws of physics. <laughs> Once the voting is complete, the selections are discussed and potentially regrouped and reframed again. Then decisions are made on what to prototype first. <clears throat> At the end of our four-step process, the goal is to say something like, well, we had 141 ideas, we grouped into these six categories, and based on our focal points, we selected eight killer ideas to prototype. And then we prior prioritized the list, and our first prototype is and it is possible to back off from one of the wild ideas just a little and turn it into a great idea. If you follow all four steps and get results that your life design brainstorming will be more than worth it, the brainstorm will generate energy and momentum towards your goal of coming up with some prototype experiences to explore. It will also be an exercise where you can turn whatever you want into some new ideas, some community support, or just a little more fun in your life with the people you trust. A great way to do this would be to combine your Odyssey plan presentation gathering with a prototype experience brainstorm session. Your collaborators will have a much better time if they are not only able to give you feedback, but also to contribute directly into your life design with ideas and actionable prototype possibilities. <laughs>